Merry Christmas, Highlands. It's already December. I can't believe it's already December. Christmas is three weeks from today. What that means for guys is nothing. We'll just wait till Christmas Eve to get all of our gifts anyway, and so we don't plan ahead. And uh, we have a big week here at the Highlands. Pastor Jim just mentioned we have a big women's event on Friday night. It's going to be a great time for you ladies. But also Saturday, uh, last year we were at the parade on the boulevard in Lancaster, and Amy and I were watching. It was just a fun time with the community. We're like, wouldn't it be fun to have a Christmas float from our church and so we're this Saturday in East Palmdale at 10 o'clock we're having a Christmas float in the Palmdale parade it's gonna be so fun to just in a fun creative way share the love of Jesus so make sure you come out and uh, support uh, the parade our float it's gonna be a great time on Saturday and then I wanted to let you know because some of you are planners and so we're not having in-person services on Christmas Sunday or New Year's Sunday so we're having things available online. In fact, we're recording some special elements for a Christmas special that will run 24 hours on Christmas Day. So make sure you, you get a, some time aside with your family and watch the stream uh, at each hour. Just pick an hour to watch. And then on New Year's Day, we just, we're having a big New Year's Eve service. You don't want to miss that. We're going to have a great time. But we'll have live stream services on New Year's Day at 8.30, 10, and 11.30. But we just, you know, I've been talking with a lot of people in our church over the last few weeks, and I just think our church, we need some rest. So I pray for some rest for you in this holiday season. And so uh, we'll still worship together and partner online. And for those who are watching online, we thank you for being with us. But uh, this is going to be a great season. We're excited for it. And then our gift to Jesus, don't forget about that. As we are really reaching and helping and supporting our community, we have a lot of great things that we're partnering with, some organizations. We'll talk about the rest of this month, but we're excited about the Gifts to Jesus campaign as we give to our community. Well, what is the weirdest gift that you have ever been given? The weirdest gift. Now, if it was from your spouse, don't say it out loud, don't point or elbow, like that's not good, okay? Because then you may get no gift this Christmas season. But I remember I was, a, I was in my 20s, I was a pastor, um, I was married, and my mom, and I love my mom, but she gave me, I think, the weirdest gift that I've ever been given. I still think it might have been a gag gift all these years later, but she won't admit to that. And so we're exchanging gifts on Christmas, and so I open up this present, and inside is a ceramic log cabin syrup warmer. The chimney opened up and you put syrup in, you could warm it up. And I'm like, mom, like, I mean, I like pancakes and French toast and waffles, but I'm a 20 something guy. Like, what is this about? I was wondering if it got crossed with maybe she was gonna give it to one of her older sisters, but she never admitted to that. And no, I got this for you. And I was thinking, what, what is the doilies next? Like, what are you giving me also? Like, what else is going to happen in this Christmas gift exchange? And so I remember thinking, like, what am I going to do with a log cabin syrup warmer? Now, in three weeks, some of you are going to have the same thought. Your, your spouse is going to give you a gift, and I know you. Your first thought is, can I exchange this? Like, you're going to get this gift, and outwardly, oh, thank you so much, honey. I love it so much. And inwardly, you're like, is there a receipt in there? Can I go find that? I need to make sure I, what store did they get it from? Because I'm going to exchange this. Because what's going to happen is you're going to open the gifts on the 25th, and then you know what you're doing on the 26th? Go to the store and exchange it. Like, there's me lines wrapped around the store, because we want to get something that we want and not the gift that was actually given to us. And then just to finish out the story, I did not have a receipt for the log cabin warmer, and I do not know where it is to this day. And so let me just tell you that often we get gifts that we want to exchange. That is the series that we're talking about this month as we think about Sundays and Wednesdays about the gift exchange. You and I, we give God a lot of dumb gifts. We give God a lot of terrible gifts. We give God a lot of gifts that we're like, all right, God, well, here you go. But then God exchanges those gifts and gives us something incredible. So today I want to talk about give God your search and he'll give you a star, a star. One of my favorite characters in the whole Christmas story is the, is the, the characters of the wise men. I love the thought that they are just seeking and searching and we're going to talk about the wise men today as we think about you and I searching for things. You see, all of us, no matter your age group, we're searching for something. Maybe you are a recent retiree and now you're searching for significance. You're searching for something to matter in this, this back half of your life. Maybe you are searching for hope. You've gone through a breakup or a divorce or you just have had a loss of a job or you thought you had something lined up and it didn't work out and now you're searching for hope. 
You know, our young people are searching oftentimes for an identity. Our education system is not doing our youth any favors because now we're introducing all this curriculum about uh, questioning their identity, questioning their gender. And, and I don't know if you remember this, but when you were in middle school or younger, those were some awkward years for us. I remember when I was in middle school, I was, uh, I'm not a tall guy now, but I was even shorter than that. I was like four foot something. I had these huge glasses. They were like several inches thick. I had a gap in my teeth. I was insanely shy. I was not what I am today. No, I'm just kidding. Like I, uh, <laughs> just kidding. I, I was this nerdy, awkward middle school boy that I didn't even have a chance but now you throw in, well, are you really a boy? Are you really a girl? I, I, parents, I don't care if your kids are private schooled or, or public schooled. Everyone needs to have a little bit of homeschool so that we're teaching them that their identity is found in Jesus. But let me tell you, all of us, no matter the age, we're searching for something. We're searching for something. And so what I want to share with you today as we look at Matthew chapter number 2, I want to talk through the, the search of the wise men. If you have your Bible or look on the screen, we have the verses there. But Matthew chapter number 2, we find in verse number 1, it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of King Herod, wise men from the east arrived in Jerusalem. They were saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. So look at verse number three. When King Herod heard this, he was deeply disturbed and all Jerusalem with him. So he assembled all the chief priests and scribes of the people and asked them where the Christ would be born. So they said in verse five, in Bethlehem of Judea, they told him because this is what was written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, because out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So look at verse number seven. Then Herod secretly summoned the wise men and asked them the exact time the star appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for the child, because when you find him, report back to me so that I too can go worship him. So what happens in verse number nine? After hearing the king, they went on their way, and there it was, the star that they had seen, its, uh, seen at its rising. It led them until it came and stopped above the place where the child was. And I love verse number 10. When they saw the star, they were overwhelmed with joy. You see, you and I, when we're searching for things, when we're looking for meaning, for hope, significance, and Jesus shows up, you will be overwhelmed with joy. But what happens in verse number 11 says this, entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and falling to their knees, they worshiped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. You see, these wise men were searching for the king. They were searching for a savior, and God gave them a star. What was the last thing that you searched for? For me, it was a few weeks ago, I was searching for a flight. Uh, I, I play this game. I don't know if this, is, if this is you, but if I ever have a flight, I play this game where I, wa I don't want to wait at the airport one minute longer than I have to. And so I try to plan it where I get to the airport right as they're about to board, and then I get on. Now, my stress level is high, but my wait time is low, so it evens out. So this is, how, this is the game that I play. So a few weeks ago, I was flying to Nashville, and so my, uh, I was flying out of Burbank, and so after the 1130 service, I had to race out of here. I booked it to Burbank. I got there with 15 minutes to spare. And I'm thinking, like, this is awesome. I haven't eaten all day. I'm going to go on a flight for three hours to Dallas, but it's okay. I didn't wait in the airport. So I get to the airport, and I'm expecting to board on the plane, and all of a sudden they announce, ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry, we're going to have a 30-minute delay. Ah, oh, man. I could have eaten, I could have gotten in and out, I could have had something, like, oh, all right. So then 30 minutes turned into one hour, one hour turned into two hours, two hours turned into a three-hour delay. I'm at Burbank Airport for three hours, and then because God has a sense of humor, and by the way, if you don't think God has a sense of humor, you just need to follow me around because I know he does. He shows it in my life all the time. Because I didn't eat for three hours, because I'm like waiting, I'm like, no, they're gonna, they're gonna board, we're gonna get on, we're gonna get on. So finally, I got a, a, something to eat. Five minutes later, we are now boarding. I'm like, oh, I can't even eat this right now. Like, what is this? Because you don't wanna bring your greasy food on an airplane, and don't be that person. 
Well, my layover in Dallas uh, was a short layover too, so I missed my layover in Dallas, which means I got stuck in Dallas that night, and there was no more flights to Nashville that night, so I had to search for a flight. There was only a few options that were not booked, and so I booked a flight, but here is the problem with this flight. The only seat available on this entire flight was the middle seat, the middle seat. Now, I don't believe in purgatory, but if I did, purgatory would be the middle seat of an airplane. That's where, like, dreams die. That's where body odor odor rises. Like, it is just, it is the armpit of an airplane, the middle seat. I just hate the middle seat. Some of you like the aisle seat, but then you get annoyed when people want to leave. That's your choice. My preference is the window seat, because I like to control how much lights come in the airplane. Like, I'm a control freak. I'm a weirdo, but I'm your pastor. You have to love me, so that's just who I am. And so I'm in this middle seat from Dallas to Nashville. I'm just like, oh, I, I was trying to have some comfort. I, was, I had a window seat on my uh, flight that got delayed. I had a window seat on my earlier flight. And so all of a sudden, I was searching for all these things. And all of us search for something. Now, maybe you're not searching for an aisle seat or you're searching for a flight, but many times you're searching for maybe a promotion. You're searching for a house. You're searching for a school. You're searching for a relationship, but all of us are searching for something in our life today. So how can we search wisely in today's world? We're going to take a few cues from the wise men as they began to search and God gives them a star that I want to encourage you with from our, our verses here today in Matthew chapter 2. Because here's the first cue that we find from the wise men. And it always starts with this. You're not going to be surprised. Because in verse number 2 of Matthew 2, we read this from the wise men. It says, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star at its rising and have come to worship him. If you're going to search wisely in today's world, it is always going to start with studying scriptures. Studying Scriptures. You might say, well, Pastor Jeremy, you always talk about the Bible. It always is about this. And let me tell you, we are men and women of the Word here at the Highlands. Like, we must search. We must start. We must study the Scriptures. In fact, scholars believe that the wise men, when they referenced the star in Matthew 2, verse 2, they were actually referencing a, a prophecy in Numbers. Numbers 24, 17, we read this. I see him, but not now. I perceive him, but not near. A star will come from Jacob, and a scepter will arise from Israel, and he will smash the forehead of Moab and strike down all the Shethites. And so what we're finding here is that the only reason that the wise men knew there was a star was because they had studied the scriptures. Now some of you are studying the holiday movie schedule across all the channels. I read this week there's 169 Christmas movies available to stream, and that's only the Christmas print series on Netflix. Like, there's a lot of Christmas movies that we're going to watch and study, and you have it planned out. You're going to watch this here and with this family member and with these friends, and you're going to study all these things. But let me tell you, we need to study scriptures. It starts with God's word. One of the things I love about uh, the wise men was uh, when you and I, when we're searching, we normally search out. We're looking for, oh man, if that boss would just notice me and give me this promotion, that's what I need. Well, if this boy, if this girl would just notice me and we began a relationship, like that was what I need. Man, if if this lined up and I was able to sell this property and buy this property and, and this would work out, this is what I need. We begin to search out. But do you know what the wise men did? They didn't search out. They searched up. And so too often you and I were looking for our searching, our solutions in other people. But the wise men, they were looking up and they said, there is a star that God promised to us hundreds of years before. Often you and I were searching for, it's just like the old country song, we're searching in the wrong places. That's why you like country music, by the way, because they're always searching for something. They're searching for an ex, for a dog, for whiskey. I don't even know what country music stars search for, but they're searching in the wrong places, let me tell you. Because we're searching out. We're searching in something. We're searching even in a vice. But God says, hey, if you search the scriptures, if you study the scriptures and you look up, I will give you a star. These wise men, they studied scriptures and they knew the prophecy and God led them to a star. They did uh, research uh, a few years ago where they, they were wondering, okay, how many times should a Christian engage with God's word before it actually brings out a change in their life? in their decision-making, in their parenting, in their marriages. And so all the Christians who would engage with the Bible one time, perhaps on Sunday, it didn't really make a difference in their everyday life throughout the rest of the week. 
Christians that engaged two times or three times, there wasn't really any difference in how they lived their life throughout the week. It was actually when Christians would engage in scriptures at least four times a week was when real results began to come out and live out in their life. And so what we find here is when you and I, when we give our week to God and we say, God, I'm going to work today, but before I do, I'm going to engage in your word. I want you to filter my decisions through your word today. That's when change comes. We must study the scriptures. We must find what God has for us. But not only do we study scriptures, but we also find ourselves, as we look at the story, we need to walk in a pack. Walk in a pack. I love this from the wise men. When you read Matthew chapter 2, verse 1, verse 7, verse 8, you'll find that all of these wise men are together. You won't find them that they're separated or splintered off. You won't find one wise man over here off on his own, and this other wise man over here doing a search, this other wise man kind of following his own star. They're all together. When you look at the life of Jesus, rarely is he alone. And even when he is alone, uh, like praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, for example, towards the end of his life, he's got Peter, James, and John very, very near to him. They're sleeping, and they're not any help, but they're, uh, they're with Jesus. I, I love this because often we get this pack phrase from, uh, from wolves. Wolves are very smart animals, and uh, we have the phrase wolf pack, and we get that from these wolves because they travel, they never travel alone. They always travel in a pack. They travel together. They hunt together. They travel together. They go fetch things together. They are always together. But there's another phrase that we've cured from from the wolf tribe, and that is a lone wolf, if you've heard of this phrase. A lone wolf in our vernacular means that, well, they're off to their own. They're, They're a loner. They don't like people. They don't like to be around people. They're just a lone wolf. They just like to do their own thing. But often, if you were to call a wolf a lone wolf, that that's not how they operate. If you see a wolf by itself, it is a very temporary position because they are either looking for their old pack, they're trying to find a new pack, but that time that they're a lone wolf is actually very compressed. So if you've been a lone wolf, for example, for, for months, for years, for decades, let me tell you, that is not how God's called you to live. In fact, Ecclesiastes, we find this passage that uh, Solomon writes in verse number 9 of chapter 4. He says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. For if either falls, his companion can lift him up, but pity the one who falls without another to lift him up. You see, you and I must walk in a pack together. There is no room in God's church for the lone wolves. Now, many of you, and perhaps you've been coming to this church for a long time, and you still don't know anybody's name. You still haven't connected in with anybody. You're a lone wolf. You're a spiritual lone wolf. And that's not the calling that God has for you. This past week, I asked her permission, but there's a lady in our church named Danica, and she posted this unsolicited. Uh, it, was, uh, it, it, it sounds like a paid promotion for life groups and women's ministry in particular, but this was on her own. I asked her for permission to, to, uh, to share this. She made this post. I don't go on Facebook very often, but uh, I did this week. I appreciate, by the way, your birthday wishes, and I'm trying to respond to those messages, but I saw her post this, and I was like, this is perfect for the message on Sunday. So here's what Danica wrote on Facebook this week. She says this. She says, church isn't a Sunday kind of thing. I wanted to take a moment and share with you something that only God could have done. Twelve weeks ago, I stepped out in faith and decided to give life groups another chance. I started going to women's ministry at the Highlands on Thursdays, and it has been life-changing. The table I sat at has become my life partners. They have gone beyond and blessed us, prayed over us, and stood in the gap. They spoke life over us, allowed us to be real, to cry, to heal. If you are going to church only on Sunday, you are missing the most important part of church, family. Church isn't just a Sunday thing. Church is where you find your tribe, your people. Church is supposed to be your family when your family lives too far away or when your family is broken or when you don't even have a family. If you only go to church on Sunday, I encourage you to step out in faith to get to know the people who sit next to you on Sunday, join a life group, and volunteer. Now, now this is her perspective over the last several weeks. And let me tell you, this is someone who is not a lone wolf, who's not traveling alone. We had a men's breakfast yesterday. We have a women's event this Friday. We have all these things happening even on a regular rotation starting next month in January. And let me encourage you that if you're the lone wolf, that is not a badge of honor. That's something that the enemy is using to keep you separated from the community that God has raised up here at the Highlands. And so let me tell you, if you want to search wisely today, 
in this world, then it starts with studying scriptures, but it continues with walking in a pack. Who is those that you, who are those brothers, those sisters that you can call on when things go south, when things, when things hurt, when, when things implode or explode? Who are those people that you can connect in with and say, would you pray for me? I'm struggling right now. Would you keep me accountable? Would you help me to, to work through this problem, through this solution? We walk in a pack. Not only do we study scriptures and we walk in a pack, there's a third cue we take from the wise men, and we find this later on in the story in verse number 12. It says this, Being warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. You see, if we're going to search wisely in today's world, then we also need to listen for God's voice. Listen for God's voice. Now, there's a difference between listening to God's voice and listening for God's voice. Oftentimes when we listen to God's voice, we're just getting commands. We're just, okay, God, I'll do that. Okay, I'll have that. Okay, I'll be there. And those are good, but it's just very reactive. Okay, God's telling me to do this, and I'll do that. But when you think about scriptures, when you think about the wise men, we think of Samuel early in the Old Testament, when they began to listen for God's voice, they were more proactive. They were saying, okay, God, what do you have for me today? How can I listen for your voice? Now, here's one of the struggles that we have in America today. There's a lot of voices. There's a lot of news voices. There's a lot of political voices. There's a lot of spiritual voices. There's a lot of voices that you and I have. You might have a, another pra, a preacher that you like to listen to. There's maybe another church that you like to be a part of or, or watch during the week. I know there's messages that I like to listen to from other pastors, and we can crowd our world with lots of voices, but let me encourage you that God's voice must be the primary voice that you're listening for. Now, I love pastors. I'm not making fun of pastors, but pastors, uh, we, they, they do this weird thing sometimes where they quote themselves online. I don't know if you've seen this before, but maybe on social media, and they'll put a picture, you know, it's like a great picture of them like on the stage, or they're just like this expressive, and it's just this like action shot of them. And then they'll put a quote from their message, and then they'll put a line and then their name. I'm just like, you're quoting yourself on your social media? Like, what are you doing? I'm not making fun of them publicly. I don't comment on their posts like, bro, stop it. But inside, I'm just like, what is wrong? But what I've seen sometimes when pastors like to hear their own voices, we'll say something crazy, and it sounds good, but then you're like, what does that actually mean? Like, like for example, and I made this up myself. This isn't yours. Don't take this. This is mine, okay? So the quote I was thinking this week that you can say with passion, and maybe it sounds good, but you're like, what does that mean? I could say, Church, Jesus is better than an all-you-can-eat buffet. You might be like, what? I like buffets. Jesus is better? Like, what does that mean? And if I say with enough gusto, if enough passion, raise the decibels, you might be like, oh, yeah, that's good, I guess. Because we like to hear our own voice. We like to just say, all right, this is awesome. This is perfect. And then you go back home, and you're like, what did that mean in my life? We crowd our world with too many voices. There's one phrase that you've perhaps heard or seen that I, I just don't understand. And you've seen on the bumper sticker, God is my co-pilot. Now on the surface, it sounds good. Like, oh yeah, God's in the passenger seat with me and he's helping me. He's not quite has the wheel, but he's near the wheel and he's my co-pilot and this is good. But let me tell you, I, I've learned uh, something new recently. I've seen this phrase in a whole new light because I'm now teaching my oldest daughter how to drive. Pray for me. I take her into the emptiest parking lot I know in Anno Valley. And we drive for about an hour. And I have to tell you, when my oldest daughter Avery is in the driver's seat, I am not the co-pilot. I don't have a brake side on my, a system on my side, although I'm thinking about investing in those fancy driving school cars where I have a brake. But when Avery's driving and all of a sudden I see something happening, I'm like, all I can do is yell. Like, brake, stop, what are you doing? Get me out of here, call Amy. Like, I'm not doing this anymore. And I've realized that when she's driving, I'm not the co-pilot. But let me tell you, when, when you're driving, when you don't allow God in there, he's not the co-pilot either. And so we listen to these voices, we listen to these people, we listen to these phrases that, that really don't mean a lot. But let me encourage you to listen for 
God's voice. Too often, you and I, we, we listen to, to our friend's voice. We listen to uh, maybe even someone else's voice that we like, but it's not as important. It's not as, uh, just, it's not as critical as God's voice for us. You see, when you and I think about this idea, when we studying scriptures, when we are walking in a pack, when we are listening for God's voice, what we're doing, what we're ultimately engaging with is we're engaging with the greatest search. Because David, he writes this, this little phrase in Psalm 139 where he says this, he says, search me, O God. You see, we're all searching for things, but really the ultimate search is when God searches us. I, when I, my girls were younger, I would play hide and seek with them, and they were little, and uh, they were, uh, they, they always found the worst hiding spots. Like, they would just, like, get under the bed, and I could see their feet, and they would be giggling. I'm just like, I see you. Like, what are you doing? I need to, re- I need to work on your hiding skills right now. Or they would hide in the, maybe the curtains, and you could see their feet underneath, and you just hear them before you even saw them. And, but I don't know if you've ever played hide-and-go-seek with maybe your kids when they were younger, or maybe your nephews or nieces, or maybe your cousins, but the point of hide-and-seek when they're young is not is not uh, the search. It's not to, the seeking. It's actually the finding. Because the point of these, my daughters, they wanted me to find them. They wanted me to, to, to seek them, to, to search for them. But many times, you and I, we hide from, from God. We say, God, uh, you know, I appreciate you on Sundays, but I'm just going to need you to let me do what I need to do on Mondays. And in fact, close your ears because I'm about to say something that I don't want you to hear. Well, God, I mean, I, I, I worship you on Sundays. I appreciate what you've done for me, but I'm about to do something that I'm going to need you to turn away because I just have to get ahead of my business, and so I'm just going to do this. And so you turn away. And many times we forget that God is searching us. That's why this Christmas season, we're going to have people uh, coming into our church that, that perhaps they're invited by a friend. Maybe it's a family member that will come at Christmas time. Maybe you're here today because you're like, all right, it's Christmas season. I guess I'll go to church once. And we are so glad that you're here. But I want you to know, no matter your religious background, all of us are searching for something. We all have this space in our heart that we need Jesus to find us. And that's why David says, search me, O oh God. You see, you and I, we try to hide. It started with Adam and Eve. They were hiding from God in the garden. And you and I will try to hide our own shame, our own sin. But let me tell you, while you're searching for your answers, God is searching for you. And he wants to find you. He wants to help you. He wants to heal you and make you whole. But it starts with this saying, God, I, I know that I've done wrong. I, I know that I don't have it all together. And I need a Savior. I need someone to come into this space, come into my life and forgive me. You see, many times you and I, we are searching for other things, but all we really need is this relationship, this connection with Jesus. We search out. We're searching for this promotion. We're searching for this possession. We're even searching maybe for a vice that will give us some temporary uh, solution, a temporary uh, peace. But ultimately, we need to search up. We need to say, God, there's your star. Thank you for guiding me. I submit to your will. This is the great gift exchange. We give God our search. We give God all of our faults and failures, and we give God all of our sins and our regrets, and we say, God, I don't know what you're going to do with it, but here you go. And he gives us a star and says, this is my son. This is your savior. All you need to do is say yes. All you need to do is say, God, would you forgive me? I trust in your son, Jesus. I don't know what you're searching for today. I don't know what has been on your heart. I don't know what this Christmas season is bringing up or, or maybe even kind of bringing to the surface of some old wounds or some, some things that have not been healed yet in your life, but all of us are searching for something. Study scriptures. Walk in a pack, but listen for God's voice because when you give him your search, he'll give you a star. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes as we wrap up our time together? I want to encourage you to, whatever you're searching for right now, whatever that hole in your heart is, that you would say, God, I'm going to give you my search this Christmas season. It's not going to come in a Christmas bonus or a first-of-the-year promotion or a new relationship, and those things are great, but we know that they only offer a temporary solution. And so I'm going to, we're going to ask God, God, would you give us a star to guide us along your path?